9. The Kim Kardashian of Crime Claudia Oshoa Felice gained notoriety as the alleged lead assassin under Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, who ran the infamous Sinaloa drug cartel. While the public at large came to know her as the Kim Kardashian of crime, people involved in the drug world called her the Empress of Anthrax because the murder squad she supposedly led was called Los Anthrax. The leaks, who worked as a model by day, denied being involved with the Sinaloa cartel, despite having a romantic past with a high-ranking member named Jose Rodrigo Arachiga. Her life was tragically cut short in late 2019 when she died from a drug overdose at 35 years old. She was found at a home in the state of Sinaloa the day after going out to dinner and to a nightclub. Because of her rumored position in the cartel, rumors began to circulate that Felix had been assassinated. But police did not suspect the man she was with when she died of foul play and they reassured the public that she did not meet a violent end. There were no ongoing criminal investigations into her activities when she died, suggesting that perhaps Felix was telling the truth when she denied being part of El Chapo's criminal underworld. Nobody seems to know for sure whether she actually worked as a hit woman for the cartel or if it's just internet gossip. 8. The John Patterson Kidnapping John Patterson was a diplomat who started working in the U.S. consulate in Hermosilla in 1974. Just two months into the job, he disappeared one morning. Hours later, a note appeared at the consulate. It was clearly Patterson's handwriting, but definitely not his words. The letters stated that he had been taken hostage by a group called the People's Liberation Army of Mexico. They demanded a $500,000 ransom, as well as a news blackout. The group threatened that if word leaked out of Patterson's kidnapping, they would kill one U.S. official or a member of an official's family every week. Patterson was the seventh U.S. diplomat to be abducted in little over a year's time. Determined not to cave to the mounting demands for money in exchange for the safe return of consular staff, then-President Richard Nixon created a new law making it illegal to negotiate with terrorists or concede to their demands. Patterson's wife, Andra, did everything in her power to try to get her husband back to safety. When news of his kidnapping hit the media, she publicly apologized to his captors for it, even though it was out of her hands. Andra released newspaper ads and made announcements offering the abductors a $250,000 ransom and pleading with them to contact her. They never responded. At one point, people began to wonder if the whole thing was a hoax. Someone claiming to be a captive alongside Patterson called the consulate. In a suspiciously American-sounding accent, he told staff to have Andra travel to a hotel and give him the ransom money. She stayed at the hotel for several days, and nobody ever showed up to collect the payment. The FBI finally zeroed in on a suspect named Bobby Joe Kesey, who was staying at a hotel near the consulate when Patterson vanished. Kesey admitted to writing at least one ransom demand letter, but denied having anything to do with Patterson's disappearance. Prosecutors couldn't prove otherwise, so they offered Kesey a plea deal on a conspiracy to kidnap charge. He spent just 11 years in prison. A peasant discovered Patterson's decomposed body in the desert 345 miles 555 kilometers north of Hermosilla. The skull and back bore signs of repeated violent blows. Kesey ultimately proved that he couldn't resist a good scam even if it meant killing someone. He landed himself back in prison for the murder of a man he had tried to swindle. And this time, he's never getting out. 7. Gender Reveal Tragedy Expecting parents seem to be getting more and more creative with their gender reveal stunts. 
But for some, the desire to pull off the biggest, best, or most unique gender reveal comes at a cost. Earlier this year, a couple thought it would be a fun idea to tell the world they were expecting a baby girl by having a plane fly by and release pink smoke over the waters off Cancun. Footage of the event shows the smoke spewing from the Cessna right before the plane suddenly crashes into the water. The mother and father-to-be could do little more than look on in horror as a day they had gone out of their way to make an awesome memory quickly turned into one they probably wish they could forget. It didn't help that just minutes before, while the plane performed some stunts, a guest at the party had made a joke about how they were fine with the plane crashing, as long as it didn't hit them. Two people died in the tragedy. Unlike some other gender reveals gone wrong in recent years, the incident may not have resulted from sheer recklessness. The couple paid to rent the plane, and it's probably safe to assume that whoever was flying it was a licensed pilot. Authorities haven't said anything about the circumstances of the crash, and it's possible that the matter is still being investigated. 6. Pat Landers and Carla Baca the COVID-19 pandemic took the world by storm, leaving countless people stranded far from home as life ground to a screeching halt. 32-year-old Pat Landers and his girlfriend of six months, Carla Baca, found themselves quarantining together in Juarez, Mexico. Carla was from the area, but Landers was visiting from New York State when the Mexican government issued a stay-at-home order. A little over a month into the lockdown, the pair were shot dead in broad daylight while sitting in their Jeep outside a cell phone store. Using three different caliber weapons, the shooters pumped between 20 and 30 bullets into the couple. Police were unable to determine a motive for the double murder and have not named any suspects. Photos of the crime scene show that most of the shots seem to be aimed at the passenger seat, where Carla was sitting. Law enforcement refused to comment when asked about whether they think she may have been specifically targeted. The tragic slayings of Baca and Landers were just two of over 100 killings that happened in the area since the stay-at-home order had taken effect. Juarez was already notorious for its high crime rates before the pandemic, and the problem worsened during lockdown. 5. Juan Hernandez 15-year-old Juan Hernandez never expected to lose his life during a family vacation in Cancun back in 2015. While visiting the Mayan ruins at Tulum just days into the trip, the teen felt a burning sensation in his leg and realized that he was injured. He hadn't noticed at first because the wound was on a part of his body where he had no feeling due to a childhood accident. Hernandez had been bitten by a pit viper. He went to the hospital where he began to feel excruciating pain. Black and purple spots appeared on the teen's body as things continued to go from bad to worse. Juan's parents went to four different hospitals in a desperate scramble for antivenom. The first three hospitals didn't have any, and the staff at the fourth hospital allegedly took their time getting around to administering it. The boy's mother, Karina, told San Antonio news station KHOU that she begged employees to give her son the life-saving antidote, but her pleas fell on deaf ears. Juan bled to death after suffering for 30 hours. Believing that her son would probably still be alive if this had happened in the U.S., Karina used his death as an opportunity to warn others to travel with utmost caution and to prepare for possible medical emergencies. Do you think things would have been different if this happened in a different country? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. 4. Migrant Kidnappings Smuggling vulnerable, undocumented migrants from Central and South America to the U.S. is a lucrative industry. And the so-called guides who promise to get people who are desperate for a better life from point A to point B do not always live up to their end of the deal. Many migrants are kidnapped by the very people they trust and pay to help them reach safety. 
Oftentimes, the smugglers who agree to help asylum seekers are working for drug cartels like Los Zetas, which has a reputation for being ruthlessly violent and placing little to no value on human life. Kidnappings are known to happen in at least eight Mexican states where cartels control vast territories. Migrants are often held for ransoms that they and their families can't pay after already giving their last dollar to the smugglers. Survivors describe the captors as heartless, with some witness accounts claiming that the criminals even subject children to brutal interrogations and threats. These abuses are rarely reported, presumably because the victims are usually trying to cross international borders illegally and fear getting into trouble with the law themselves. And cartels often have connections to corrupt law enforcement, giving them an automatic upper hand either way. As a result, kidnappings and other horrifying crimes against migrants typically go unchecked. 3. Giovanni Lopez Ramirez Mexico is plagued by ongoing police corruption and abuse of power. Numerous unarmed civilians have been killed in recent years while in police custody, and law enforcement has been accused of using torture and other brutal punishments on detainees. Last year, the nonprofit organization Human Rights Watch, HRW, released a statement calling on Mexican officials to hold crooked cops responsible for their actions and to professionalize the country's police forces. HRW spokesperson Jose Miguel Vivanco mentioned the ties between Mexican law enforcement and organized crime and cited ongoing protests as proof that the public's distrust of the police runs deep. The protests were sparked by viral footage that showed officers violently arresting a construction worker named Giovanni Lopez Ramirez for violating a COVID mask mandate. When Ramirez's family went to pick him up from jail, the police sent them to the morgue where they found him covered in bruises with a bullet lodged in his leg. Officials told the devastated relatives that the police had simply gotten carried away with their treatment of Ramirez. A local leader allegedly offered the victim's brother money to keep the story quiet and threatened to kill the family if they spoke out. Activists took to the streets to voice their outrage. Instead of taking it as a sign to clean up their act, police reportedly dressed plain clothes and threatened demonstrators with baseball bats. They were also accused of cramming protesters into a van and abandoning them in the middle of nowhere. Several officers were charged with torturing and killing Ramirez. Their trials are ongoing, but giving Mexico's history of police corruption it's hard to have high hopes that justice will be served. 2. Kidnapped into Crime Technology is a wonderful thing, but it has also made children more accessible to predators, leading us to the next item on today's list. A group of five kids between the ages of 12 and 15 who live in the city of Oaxaca became avid players of what seemed like a harmless video game called Free Fire. Little did they know, members of the Northeast Cartel noticed their passion for the shooting game and thought that the youths might be just as skilled with real guns. The criminals reached out to the kids after finding them in a WhatsApp group dedicated to the game and offered the adolescents big money to work for the crime syndicate. They took the bait and soon disappeared. One boy even wrote his parents a goodbye letter, telling them not to worry about him and saying that he'd send money home soon. The boys were taken to a cartel safe house, where it became clear that they were being held against their will. Realizing they'd made a huge mistake, they uploaded their photos to social media and pleaded for someone to rescue them. Security officials traced the children's cell phones and went to the house. A woman who answered the door claimed that a child's birthday party was going on, but law enforcement didn't buy the story. They went inside the home and found the captives, who were safely reunited with their families. 
Cartels are increasingly using violent video games as a platform for finding and grooming new prospects. They specifically target teens who are impressionable and easy to manipulate. Adolescents are lured by the promise of money, nice things, and in some cases, a better life for their family. What these headhunters don't tell kids is that fresh recruits carry out a crime ring's most dangerous jobs. And with an estimated 35,000 or more teens joining cartels every year in Mexico, these low-level criminals in training are easily replaceable. It's a system that exploits children by design and could easily turn deadly. 1. When a prank became reality Areline Martinez was an avid TikToker who, like many people who use the social media platform, thought it would be funny to film a prank for her followers. About a year ago, the 20-year-old got 10 of her friends to stage a kidnapping outside her home in the state of Chihuahua and film the encounter. In the video, Martinez appears to be blindfolded and bound by the wrists and ankles. A man seated next to her played the role of a fellow hostage, while another male attacked her and his accomplice waved a gun in the air. The footage shows the pretend male hostage being forced to his knees with a gun to his head shortly before someone accidentally shoots Martinez dead. Everyone fled the scene, and only one person bothered to call the police. Some friends. Speaking with the Mexican news outlet Preciso, Chihuahua State Attorney General Cesar Augusto Piniche said that someone probably tampered with a gun without realizing that it was loaded. He said that an investigation was necessary and reassured the public that if anyone meant to harm Martinez, they would be held criminally responsible. Tragedies like this serve as sobering reminders that at the end of the day, it's not worth putting oneself in danger just for attention on social media. Number 9. Nathaniel Fajita and Lauren Astley Lauren Astley was just 18 years old when her life was tragically cut short at the hands of her high school sweetheart, Nate Fajita. The couple had just graduated from Wayland High School in Massachusetts and had recently broken up after dating for several years. Fujita strangled and stabbed Lauren to death in July of 2011 and then discarded her body in a remote marsh near her home. Police charged him with first-degree murder, assault, and battery with a dangerous weapon. During the trial, prosecutors argued that Fujita's rage over the breakup motivated him to kill Lauren. He was convicted of first-degree murder and is serving a life sentence for the crime. Ten years after the horrifying ordeal, Lauren's family still grapples with the grief that Vegeta's actions have caused. Speaking with Bob Ward from Boston 25 News, her father, Malcolm Astley, said, the most dangerous time is breakups in relationships or the day of divorce. In their beloved daughter's memory, the family created the Lauren Astley Memorial Fund, which aims to educate students about healthy and unhealthy relationships. Signs of trouble to watch for and how to seek help. Number eight, William Gall and Emma Jane Walker. William Gall was a college football player from Knoxville, Tennessee, who had a bright future ahead of him. But the 18-year-old robbed himself of any life opportunities when he decided that if he couldn't have his ex-girlfriend in his life, nobody could. 16-year-old Emma Jane Walker, a cheerleader at the local high school, broke up with William in 2016. But he couldn't accept that she wanted to go on with her life without him. Instead of moving, the irate teenager shot her while she slept in her bedroom. Her body was discovered early next morning. Detectives quickly zeroed in on William as their prime suspect, worried that he would try to destroy evidence. They immediately began to keep an eye on him. He was soon taken into custody on a slew of charges related to Emma's death. In 2018, a jury found the defendant guilty of stalking, theft, tampering with evidence, reckless endangerment, possession of a firearm during the commission of a dangerous felony, and felony murder. But just as William didn't want to accept the breakup with Emma, he disapproves of the jury's decision and has requested a retrial. His request was denied based on a lack of evidence, justifying the alleged need to revisit the case in court. 
Number 7. Mike and Denise Williams Mike and Denise Williams had planned to celebrate their wedding anniversary together in 2000, but Mike never returned from a duck hunting trip. On time to celebrate, his friends and family formed a search party, which included his best friend Brian Winchester and Brian's dad. The pair found Mike's motorized canoe in Fort Bronco abandoned in Lake Seminole, Florida. His hunting license, jacket, and waders were found at the bottom of the lake, leading detectives to wonder if the man had been eaten by alligators. Eight years later, Mike's wife and high school sweetheart, Denise, stood trial for his murder. In an odd twist of events, Brian took the stand and confessed to fatally shooting Mike so that he and Denise could be together. The illicit couple had co-inspired to kill their victim after Brian, who was an insurance agent by trade, wrote up a $1.75 million policy on Mike. Brian then divorced his high school sweetheart, Kathy, and married Denise in 2005. Mike's disappearance went on Saul for some time before investigators decided to put the suspects in front of a jury, arguing that he was fatally shot and that the killers tried to make his death look accidental. All along, Denise's attorneys have argued that she played a minimal role in her former husband's murder, but she was nevertheless convicted of first-degree murder. In 2018, Denise's conviction was vacated, forcing the court to readdress her case. Thankfully, she was resentenced and will have to serve 30 years for her role in Mike's death. Brian is serving a 20-year sentence after avoiding harsher punishment by testifying against Denise. While Denise continues to deny having any role in the crime, Brian has expressed remorse for killing his best friend. Number 6. The Cadet Killers David Graham and Diane Zamora started dating in their senior year of high school in 1995. After a track meet later that year, David gave his teammate Adrian Jones a ride home and the two allegedly had sex. Diane could immediately tell something was off about David's behavior, and he confessed to the encounter about a month later. He later claimed that his irate girlfriend demanded that he kill Adrian. The pair hatched a sick plot for David to invite Adrian to go for a drive, while Diane hid in the back of his car. She took the bait. David parked next to a reservoir, where Diane came out of hiding and confronted Adrian about the cheating incident. Adrian reportedly admitted to having sex with David, but said that she didn't enjoy it because she felt guilty. The apologetic admission apparently wasn't good enough for Diane, who became enraged and attacked Adrian. The victim managed to escape the car and fled on foot, but her efforts were no match for the 9mm handgun that David used to fire two bullets into her head. Adrian's body was discovered shortly after the murder, but police were baffled for months as they attempted to identify a suspect. In the meantime, Diane and David got engaged, graduated from high school, and joined the military. They were sent to different academies, but promised to stay faithful to one another. Nearly a year after the murder, Diane confessed to her roommates, who went to the police. Both she and David were taken in for questioning and admitted to the crime. The Jones family requested that prosecutors avoid seeking the death penalty, landing both defendants a life sentence with eligibility for parole after 40 years. If only they had thought about their futures, they would have probably decided to forget about the teenage love triangle altogether. Have you ever been in a complicated love triangle? Let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Number 5. Ray and Dominique Faria Those closest to Ray and Dominique Faria knew the high school sweethearts as loving and affectionate people. They got married in 2006 and raised four children together in New Orleans. Like any couple, the pair occasionally argued according to Ray's mother, who lived with her son and wife. But she never saw any violence between the two until one day in 2018, when Ray clung to the hood of Dominic's car as she drove a half mile down the road with the kids inside. He eventually jumped off and shot at the car, firing a bullet through the windshield and into Dominic's neck. She was rushed to the hospital where she died from her injuries. The children, who were between one and 11 years old at the time, were not hurt. Police charged Ray with second-degree murder, obstruction of justice, and being a felon in possession of a firearm. The ordeal was heartbreaking for his mother, who spoke with NOLA.com shortly after the killing. In her own words, the mother said, those two were inseparable. That's why this hurts. I don't know why this happened. Dominique's aunt told the news outlet that she didn't know of any major problems between the couple, adding, why would you take this woman away from her kids? Now, they don't have a mother or father. 
Gray pleaded guilty to manslaughter and several other charges in 2019 and was sentenced to 80 years in prison. But this didn't exactly bring closure to the couple's loved ones, who struggled to make sense of what happened. Speaking with local station 4WWL, Dominique's longtime friend, Janelle Blackwell, offered a sobering summary of the tragedy, stating, everybody's at a loss, nobody wins here. Number four, Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. Tim Hack and Kelly Drew grew up in the same quiet community in southeastern Wisconsin. He was a farmer and she went to a beauty school. Everyone thought that the couple would get married, have children, and grow old together. But these visions of a happy life were crushed when the 19-year-olds vanished from a wedding reception in 1980. Their decomposing bodies were found two months later, just a few miles from where they disappeared. Someone had stabbed and strangled the couple to death, leaving detectives perplexed for the next 30 years as they struggled to identify a suspect in the puzzling case, which became known as the Sweetheart Murders. DNA technology proved to be a game changer in solving the tragic slaying. In 2009, investigators matched DNA from the crime scene to a 76-year-old Kentucky resident named Edward W. Edwards, who was working at the wedding reception venue as a handyman when Tim and Kelly were murdered. He was charged with two counts of first-degree murder, and, as it turned out, these were just a few of the many murders Edwards committed throughout his lifetime. The serial killer took at least five lives between 1977 and 1996, and is suspected of additional murders. Edwards was sentenced to death by lethal injection, but died in prison in 2011 from natural causes. Number three, Nick Conselman and Stephanie Hart Grizel. Since 1999, households across the U.S. have known about Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, where two troubled teens went on a violent shooting spree. People are less familiar with a tragedy that occurred on Valentine's Day the following year when two students were gunned down in a local Subway restaurant. An employee entered the business after driving by and noticed that the lights were still on after business hours. They found the bodies of 15-year-old Nick Conselman and 16-year-old Stephanie Hart Grizel behind the counter. Nick worked at the restaurant and Stephanie was there waiting for him to finish his shift when someone shot the couple to death. 22 years later, the case remains unsolved. Rumors that the murders were drug-related have never been proven. Detectives believe that someone out there has key information that can help bring the killer to justice. Last year, on the 21st anniversary of the slayings, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office appealed to the public on Facebook, urging anyone who knows anything to come forward so that they can finally bring closure to the case. There is a $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of a suspect who police describe as a young white man with blonde hair. Number two, Jennifer and James Faith. 48-year-old Jennifer Faith and her 49-year-old husband, James, were walking their dog in late 2020 in their Dallas, Texas neighborhood when someone shot James several times. He died in the street in a pool of blood after receiving three bullets to the head, three to the chest, and one to the pelvis. Jennifer told police that after the attacker killed her husband, they bound her wrist with duct tape and tried to steal her jewelry. She said she didn't recognize the suspect, who wore a hoodie and a face mask. Witnesses noticed that he drove a black Nissan pickup truck. The tragically widowed wife went on to local news and pleaded for anyone with information, or for the killer themselves, to come forward. She described James as the backbone of their family and said that she hoped the murderer could understand the gravity of what they had done and feel guilty enough to turn themselves in. Detectives soon discovered that Jennifer had been communicating with her high school sweetheart, Darren Rubin Lopez, around the time of her husband's murder. The pair had lost touch years earlier when Lopez joined the military and was sent to South Korea, but they evidently reconnected and had exchanged over 14,000 text messages in the weeks leading up to James's murder. The messages contained plans to kill Jennifer's husband and had been deleted in an attempt to hide them from investigators. But they managed to recover the conversations, which pointed towards the pair as their main suspects. Darren has pleaded not guilty to charges of murder and transporting a weapon over state lines to commit a felony. Jennifer pleaded guilty to a federal murder for hire charge and is awaiting sentencing, which could include the death penalty. And number one, Brian and Kelly Sue Robinette. High school sweethearts Brian and Kelly Sue Robinette established a comfortable life in Ellicott City, Maryland, where they raised a son and daughter. They managed to provide their kids with all the trappings of a middle-class lifestyle, taking them on beach vacations and sending them to college. 
Brian, who worked as a pharmacist, was 58 years old when he began thinking about retiring. He and Kelly were close with their relatives and planned to stay in the area. But the couple's future was ripped away from them last year when someone shot them to death inside their home. Police embarked on a manhunt for Brian's 46-year-old estranged half-brother, Jeffrey Burnham, who had killed their mother's 83-year-old friend, Rebecca Reynolds, and stole her SUV before driving to the Robinettes' home and murdering them. After gunning down Brian and Kelly, Jeffrey took off in the red Corvette. He was captured 18 hours later in West Virginia after telling a local firefighter that he had been forced to kill three people. According to court documents, Jeffrey disapproved of Brian's career as a pharmacist, particularly because it involved administering COVID-19 vaccines. He allegedly told someone that his half-brother was killing people with the COVID shot. The couple's friends and family were left in shock as they tried to understand why Jeffrey would murder someone he barely associated with. He faces numerous charges, including murder and Grand Theft Auto. Ten, Resident Evil. In 2019, Olivia Jackson not only lost her arm following a horrific motorcycle accident during the filming of Resident Evil, the final chapter, she also spent 17 days in a coma. The 38-year-old stunt woman collided with a camera on a mechanical crane that was being steered directly at her as she was riding the bike towards it. What should have been a perfectly standard action film sequence turned into complete horror when she smashed into the camera and flipped off her bike. Olivia has since sued the film's producers, saying she was misled over her insurance coverage. She only ended up getting paid $33,000 for the loss of her arm, which is definitely not enough. It's not like being a stunt person doesn't come with its dangers, but those dangers should obviously have a bigger payout than $33,000. These people are paid to protect the actors who make significantly more money than them. All Olivia wants is compensation for what happened while she was trying to do her job. Plus, the accident wasn't even her fault. In her lawsuit, she claimed the stunt was a disaster because of changes made at the last minute. The camera was lifted later on the final run and she wasn't informed about it. This meant she wasn't ready for where the camera was going to be and she smashed it with her forearm at 71 miles per hour. She obliterated the bone in her arm and tore the flesh off her cheek, leaving her teeth exposed like a zombie from The Walking Dead. Olivia also suffered punctured lungs, many broken bones, a severed neck artery, and brain swelling. She is extremely lucky to be alive. Olivia is still looking at 10 additional surgeries over the next few years. All she wants is some money to help pay for her medical bills, as well as recognition for what happened. 9. Deadpool Motorcycle Crash Stunt woman Joy Harris died in a tragic motorcycle accident during the filming of Deadpool 2 in Vancouver. This happened in August of 2017. The producers of the movie were slapped with a penalty of almost $300,000. They failed to provide a safe workplace for the stunt woman, and this failure left her dead. What's truly tragic is that Joy was performing her first movie stunt ever. She had been training, she was ready, and she got on that motorcycle thinking it would lead to a long career as a stunt woman. She was also the first African-American woman to be licensed to compete in races with the American Motorcyclist Association. But instead of a long career, she was ejected from the bike and crashed through a glass window and died. 8. Vin Diesel's Stunt Double Disaster During the 2019 filming of Fast and Furious 9, Vin Diesel's stunt double fell 30 feet and suffered a serious head injury. His name is Joe Watts, a British national who's worked on plenty of the biggest movies and TV shows. His list includes movies like Spider-Man, Kingsman, and shows like Game of Thrones. 
But while filming Fast and Furious at Warner Brothers Studio, one stunt nearly cost him his life. The stunt should have been simple. Joe was supposed to be thrown over the shoulder of another performer off the edge of a balcony. The balcony was 25 feet high. He was supposed to be suspended in mid-air by a wire. Something went wrong, the wire didn't catch him, and he hit the concrete floor. He had to be rushed by an air ambulance to the Royal London Hospital, where doctors said he had a fractured skull. They had to put him into a medically induced coma for five days. The only good news here is that Joe recovered. He's still alive today, although he did need to relearn a lot of basic skills. He had to learn how to talk again. And then to make things worse, his rehabilitation was interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. He was no longer able to see his physiotherapist, his occupational therapist, or his neuropsychologist. Joe is still on the road to recovery and is making progress day by day. He doesn't have any memory of what happened on the set, and he hasn't been able to work since the accident. 7. Jackass Forever's Lawsuit While filming the new Jackass Forever movie, somebody got hurt. Somebody always gets hurt when filming these things, but this time it was somebody who wasn't actually part of the movie. The victim was struck in the head with something and nearly died when a jet ski stunt went terribly wrong. He's now suing Steve O and Chris Pontius for $12 million in damages. It all started when the Jackass crew was in Puerto Rico in 2018 to film. They approached a man named Michael Vincenzo Segura and asked them if they could use his jet ski for their stunt. It was a tug-of-war deal with a bungee cord tied to both jet skis. Stuntmen on the jet skis were to hit the gas and drive away from each other as fast as they could to see what happened, but it never got that far. Because the waters were really choppy, the crew asked Michael if he could hold one of the jet skis steady as they started. But when the stuntmen hit the gas, the bungee cord snapped immediately. It hit Michael in the head at high speed and Michael had to be airlifted to the nearest hospital. This was no mere concussion. Michael was in serious trouble. He had a bleeding brain, a fractured skull, and needed to be put into a medically induced coma. He is now unable to work because he suffers chronic pain. He's traumatized, and he's covered in scars. He wants six figures from the jackass crew to help him deal with his injuries for the rest of his life. 6. The America's Got Talent Rehearsal Nightmare Not everyone who signed up for America's Got Talent had any actual talent, but professional daredevil Jonathan Goodwin did. The only issue was that when he was rehearsing his big stunt for America's Got Talent Extreme, he wound up falling 40 feet onto hard concrete after getting crushed between two cars and set on fire. Jonathan almost died in Atlanta due to the extreme injuries he suffered preparing to go on TV and show America his talent. He considered himself to be something of an escape artist, a modern-day Houdini. His stunt involved him being suspended by a wire in mid-air, with one car on either side suspended from cranes. The cars were also held by wires and when they were released, they would meet in the middle like a pendulum, right where Jonathan was hanging. He was supposed to free himself from his bonds before this happened and then fall 40 feet onto an airbag. Sadly, it all went very terribly wrong. Jonathan miscalculated his timing and didn't free himself soon enough. He was crushed when the two hanging cars crashed into him. When they collided, they lit on fire and burned his face. And if that wasn't bad enough, he fell 40 feet and missed the airbag, landing on the concrete on his head. He did survive, but it was a very close call. Plus, he didn't get to compete in the show and potentially win the big cash prize. Do you think there should have been some kind of consolation prize for Jonathan? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe before the end of the video. 5. Expendable on Expendables 2 
Kun Liu was killed by an explosion during the filming of The Expendables 2, featuring the action heroes Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger. The man was just 26 years old when he was performing on an inflatable bolt in Bulgaria. According to the Bulgarian authorities, the explosion seriously injured an unnamed stuntman while killing Kun Liu. But here's the deal. We don't really know what happened. The explosion was in 2011 and the death never really made the news in a big way. There were a few reports about it and then it vanished. We were given the dead man's name but no critical details about what actually happened. It almost seems as though it was covered up to protect what went on to be a huge success at the box office. In 2012, the parents of the stuntman sued the filmmakers, but we don't know how that turned out either. They filed a case of wrongful death against Millennium Films, but we have no idea if they settled out of court or what. All we know is that an explosion went very wrong. One stuntman lost his life, another was seriously injured, and The Expendables 2 went on to make a huge amount of money. Most people never even knew what happened during the filming. 4. Lethal Weapon Civil Casualty During the filming of the Lethal Weapon TV series in 2019, a civilian suffered a traumatic brain injury. It happened on August 22, 2018. Lethal Weapon was filming in California when Sammy Habas had his vehicle shredded by a zip line that had been set up along a street in Long Beach. The zip line was for the test run of a stunt in which the stunt person would glide across the street. The test involved sending a sandbag of 300 pounds down the zip line. Everything went okay with traffic blocked while the test stunt was underway. When the stunt was over, traffic was allowed to resume, but the cable was still there. Just as Sammy was driving near it, the cable snapped and hit his car, injuring his wife, Sandy. The vehicle was only going about 20 miles an hour. When the cable snapped and hit the car, it struck with so much force that the vehicle was lifted in the air and the front end was shredded. It even ripped apart a light pole in the process. After the accident, Sammy and Sandy filed the suit against Warner Media and Warner Brothers, seeking money for emotional damage and for the alleged traumatic brain injury. The plaintiffs went a little far, though, with the emotional damage. They've alleged that since the accident, both have required constant psychological care. They have severe emotional distress and need to be looked after by a psychiatrist at all times of the day. 3. Injury on the Maze Runner Set The star of the Maze Runner trilogy, Dylan O'Brien, was so seriously injured while filming the 2023rd installment of the franchise that the production halted for nearly a year. He was shooting a scene involving a stunt car when something went horribly wrong and it ran him over. He ended up beneath the vehicle, crushed and almost killed. He had to be rushed to the hospital, suffering from a concussion, a facial fracture, and brain trauma. According to what the actor told the media, he literally broke the majority of the right side of his face. Thankfully, Dylan did make a full recovery. One thing that's changed, according to him, is that when he puts on a rig to do a stunt, he's extremely thorough in checking it. He's also admitted that if there's a stunt and he needs to do some action, he becomes irritable and a little anxious. But after getting run over by a car on a set, you really can't blame the guy. 2. Transformers 3 Tragedy Aspiring actress Gabriela Cedillo nearly died in 2012 during the filming of Transformers 3. She was working as an extra on set and was driving one of the cars during a chase scene. The action sequence was being filmed on Klein Avenue in Chicago, with Gabriella in one car and the vehicle in front being pulled by a cable. The cable snapped and Gabriella accidentally drove straight into it. The other vehicle smashed through her windshield and hit her directly in the head, almost crushing it like an egg. She's lucky to be alive today, 
especially considering she was driving 50 miles per hour when the accident happened. But her injuries will be with her for the rest of her life. She lost one third of her head and a huge part of the right side of her brain. She was once an energetic woman eager to star in movies. Now she requires 24 hour care and will need it for the rest of her life. She'll definitely be taken care of by her friends and family, but she'll never drive another vehicle again. Her family was awarded $18.5 million in a settlement, but they'd trade it in a heartbeat to get Gabriella back the way she used to be. One, the twilight zone of despair. What happened on the final day of filming for the 1983 feature-length adaptation of The Twilight Zone has gone down in history as the worst stunt disaster ever. While shooting the final scene on the final day, actor Vic Morrow was decapitated, and two child actors were killed by a falling helicopter. This was by far the most gruesome on-set disaster. Vic Morrow is the only actor who's literally lost his head while trying to film a movie. The final scene was a big one. Vic's character was supposed to redeem himself by attempting to rescue a pair of Vietnamese children from a U.S. air raid. The man behind the controls of the helicopter was a real Vietnam veteran named Dorsey Wingo. He was new to the movie business and knew more about actual bombs than special effects. When the camera started rolling, pyrotechnic fireballs swarmed around the helicopter, and Dorsey didn't seem to know how to react. He forced the vehicle down into a river where the actors were, in front of about 100 people. Six-year-old Renee Chen was crushed as Vic Morrow dropped her from his arms. The helicopter rolled, its main blade sliced Vic's head off, and pretty much cleaved seven-year-old Micah Din Lee in half. Suffice to say, this was the end of shooting. Did hearing about all these terrible tragedies give you a whole new respect for stunt doubles? Let us know your thoughts in the comments and thanks a lot for watching. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe. See you again soon for another awesome video from the channel. Bye.